All right. How, how's everybody good, doing good, today? Good. Doing well? Um, so uh, as Paul uh, talked about, I've, I've been working on a product called Stellar Phono. And uh, previously, I've been responsible for the S300, M700, and the uh, electronics on the Sprout 100 amplifiers here. And so my main goal as a designer has been to take a little bit of the performance that we see at higher price ranges and just try to push it down, right? Because there are thousands of people trying to design you know, circuits today. And it's, it's really one of my, what I have to do is take what PS Audio can give me as far as distribution power and ability to uh, head products and try to create a product that has an amazing uh, uh, um, <coughs> value. So that's really what I'm, I'm, my goal as a designer right now is to do. So uh, when we decided to add a phono stage for the Stellar series, I was highly motivated to try to capture something that's seen at a higher price range in the still the Stellar range of retail prices. So um, for some of our viewers, they may not know exactly what a phono stage is. And so let me uh, describe that uh, for you. A uh, phono stage is going to take the signal coming out of your cartridge and apply an EQ uh, to reverse, uh, to apply a reverse transfer function to the signal. Because for vinyl to work, you need to actually apply where they need to apply an EQ to the signal. Um, so we need to actually reapply the inverse EQ of that. It's called a rea curve. And so the uh, point of a phono stage is to apply that, apply gain. Usually in the uh, typical gain values are between 40 and 70 dB. And do that in a really low distortion manner and low noise. So. Um, so for Seller Phono, I was inspired through this experience that I had when I was uh, just getting into audio. I was 20 years old, uh, going to college, and I spent all my money on my stereo system, all of it. I had VSM, Mer Merlin VSMs. I was close to, I knew B Bobby uh, Palkovic very closely. and. Um, uh, and was really into that. I had Conrad Johnson components. I had a uh, VPI Scout with a Benz glider, which I love. I love that cart. Um, and I had a cheaper phono stage that was using like 5532 op amps in it. And I thought it was pretty good. You know, I was like, I think that's what I need. It's pretty low noise, it's low distortion, all that. I saved my money for a couple months and I decided to go off on the deep end and and buy a more advanced a stage that was a tube discrete stage. And uh, it was what I consider like a one-noter. Like the first note was like, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> so, you know, this one preamp in the stage affected everything. And it just made music just pour out of my speakers. And I just remember thinking, you know, I, d I didn't know much about like technical stuff. I wasn't even a circuit designer then. I just, I was a freshman in, in uh, college. And so I'm just thinking, you know, I didn't really expect that to make that big of a difference. But the phono stage is a huge, huge part in the analog chain. It's massive. And of course, I had a pretty good turntable and, and cart to go along with that. But so what I want to do is I want to try to I wanted to try to capture that sound that high, really high resolution sound. You get uh, really good depth of field, a good width, um, and there's that feeling when you hear a good analog setup. It's like it's in the room, right? You'll go to RMAF and you'll hear these uh, like uh, 15 IPS masters. It's amazing, right? Analog is cool. Digital is awesome as well. But when analog is done really correctly, there's a big difference between cheap analog and getting into the really serious stuff, right? You get that really kind of raw in the room sound that just, it just sounds right. And 
I find a lot of phono stages, they sound very similar to me in the lower price ranges. And there's a reason why that is, is that a lot of them are using the same amps. You'll see, I can, maybe, I don't know how many of you are, you know, engineers or, or into the technical stuff, but you're going to see OPA 2134s everywhere. You're going to see, you know, your, your variety of modern op amps, integrated op amps, which are extremely high performance. They offer good measurements. Um, but in the end, they're the same phono stages over and over. It's three types of RIA equalizations. You can do a passive. You can do a hybrid. You can do um, a fully active. Okay, So those are your three RIA options. And then and there's also an LCR that's very rare. But, um, but uh, besides that, you're going to see very similar amplifiers like down to the same name brand, down to the same chip. So those are going to have certain qualities about them that are going to be limited, and they're going to dominate the sound quality. Is it, is it bad? No, when they're implemented correctly, they're pretty good. But when you step up to the discrete stuff, when you set, step up to you know, your, your, your tubes and your really high bias class A discrete stuff, it's obvious. I mean, it's not even, it's not even up for discussion in my my opinion. I mean, it's so dramatically different. And so I wanted to offer a uh, phono stage in that price range, in the stellar price range that offers that kind of uh, resolution and, and, uh, and sound quality. So uh, I've decided to go with a fully discrete design that's going to be over 700 parts. Um, it's going to be, we're going to have to match FETs. The input stage has 10 paralleled FETs for a very, very low noise, rivaling the best that's ever been. Um, the rails are, uh, have uh, three to four regulators, depending on uh, where it is in the circuit, uh, cascaded to uh, yield uh, voltage rails that I can't even really measure. I'm working on trying to measure the noise on the voltage rail. So, Right now, I'm down to about 155 dB below a volt. So that's really, really low. Um, it's lower than, bat you know, batteries have noise. So if you see phone stages saying that we're noiseless and they have bat batteries, batteries create noise too. So this is likely even lower noise than having batteries in a phone stage. Um, so so those, are, those are some of what, that's really what I'm trying to get at, is I'm trying to offer some of that that one noteness. I want someone to buy this thing, and they're coming from some, you know, like pretty good two to five hundred dollar stage, and they flick the switch on this thing, and it's that one note that comes out of the speaker, and they're just like, wow. You know, now I can't wait to like listen to this, and I can't wait to listen to that. You know, that's what we're really doing this for. And so um, I had to think about what exactly in a phono stage makes that occur? <laughs> like what, what happens in an amplifier that makes you feel that way? That's a big question because, you know, I could create an amp that maybe it, maybe, maybe it sounds like the integrated amps. You know, maybe, maybe it has the same types of, of distortion or, or characteristics of sound. So I had to think about what from a measurement standpoint and from a design standpoint, what matters? I came to the conclusion that open loop linearity, like that's when you don't have any feedback, is the key. Because all the stages that I really like the sound of, when you, if you had an open loop um, characterization of that, it would be pretty darn linear compared to these, these chips. Okay, so, so that was my main goal is to first create a circuit that is really linear with no feedback. Then I'm going to apply feedback to it, because I like feedback. I don't think feedback is, is the devil or anything. <laughs> it's not. It's that so many amplifiers are using a really nonlinear open loop path, and then they're using a lot of feedback. And then they're creating, it, creating a linear system. So they start off with a very nonlinear system 
apply a lot of feedback, and they get the linear system. I want to start off with a linear one and then improve it further. So just as an, um, a comparison, in OPA uh, 2134, which is going to be common in many uh, phono stages, uh, it's going to have an open loop gain of roughly 120 dB. That's one million times. So that's, you, you, put, you put something on the input of that open loop, and theoretically, you would get one million times, you know, although it's not stable open loop. So, um, so if you were to make that amplifier a gain of one, that means that you're applying 120 dB of feedback. So that's what we call unity gain. Okay, so when you go on the data sheet of that, you would see a figure, a distortion spec. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be point, for the 2134, it's 0.00008%. That's really low. That's with 120 dB or close to 120 dB of, of feedback. That's one million times factor improvement on the open loop um, performance. That means that OPA 2134 is more cl closer to 2 to 3 percent distortion open loop. That's really bad, especially for solid state stuff. We know that you know, solid state distortion and really complex distortion sounds really bad. So you need a lot of feedback to correct all those nonlinearities. The outcome is that it sounds pretty good, right? As chips are not bad and there's nothing, there's nothing horrible about it. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, phobic of chips. I really love them. I love to use them when I, when I want to or when I can. But I want to do better. And so I create a circuit that only needs um, roughly 20 dB of feedback to create almost the same level of performance of that 2134 with 1 million times factor improvement. So I'm only using 10 times improvement compared to their 1 million times improvement. So my open loop performance is really, really great. I do that through uh, biasing stages really hot. So there's heat, there's going to be heat coming off this thing, right? Because I'm, I'm running all class A, I'm running high currents, I'm making sure that um, uh, a lot of uh, um, loads are really high impedance, so I, I don't have that much nonlinearity. Um, and so that's kind of my direction with Stellar Phono, is to focus on the signal path, to create something that's really linear, and hopefully get to that one note, you know, kind of outcome. And so um, now is the process of going to people like Paul and our president, Jim, and saying, I have this crazy idea. And, and <laughs> guess what? Instead of 100 parts, it's 700 parts. And it's got to stay the same retail price because I'm not, I, I want to keep it in that lower price range. I want people to afford this and have a really great value. And I want it to beat out the competition in, in, in its value, just like the M700 and the Sprout 100 have done, clearly. Um, so uh, that's not the easiest conversation to have. <laughs> what was your What was your uh, response? Are you out of your freaking mind? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this thing's got to sell for a couple of grand. <laughs> You're going to try and compete with some of the best home stages in the world. And he looked yeah. at me and he said, "I can do it." And I remember that day. Then, uh, <laughs> go with our blessing. Yeah. Don't f it up. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of, you know, uh, when you go to Screet, you're talking about also production nightmare. I mean, you know, like down to matching FETs, down to uh, uh, fallouts because the THD, you know, or some spec might not be perfect because we have to go back and, and change a, a transistor for it to, to go out. I mean, you know, these integrated circuits are all laser trimmed, so everything's perfect. And so you have to make sure that you know, your discrete circuits are essentially within tolerance for it to work correctly. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems with that. Also cost, I mean, 
700 parts, that means that we have to lay <coughs> 700 parts. Every op amp that's just like, you know, would be one insertion is now 40 insertions for just transistors. And then it's, and then it's like, you know, 20 to 30 resistors and, and you know, all that. So it's a, it's a big deal. I mean, it really um, causes your uh, production to be complicated. But, but it's all about the sound. You know, and it's, and it's like, I don't want to just spit out the same amp that sounds very similar to the other ones in the price range. I want to actually come out with something that, you know, impacts people. They, they bring it home like I did, and I ended up, like, building a career around that because, you know, when I heard incredible audio equipment that touched me, that's what, you know, that, it got me hooked. I mean, I just, I can't stop. I'm still like that now, you know. I, that's why we're here. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know. So... So I want to try to reinforce that and continue going. And a part of that is not to say, hey, I'm going to reinvent the wheel because, you know, there's been thousands of phone stages. What we need to do is take the stuff that's really high performance and start pushing it down in price. And that's what, you know, our entry level line is really about. It's about giving the performance and, and, and creating a better, um, you know, quality of price ratio. Um, so... Anyways, uh, so yeah, we got through, I got through that conversation and, and I'm so happy to work for this company where they're like, you know what, we trust you. And, you know, don't F it up, but we, we believe in you, but, but don't F it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but, but you know, then the results come in and when Darren came down to my office and he said, you have to come up and hear this. And we went into the new music room in there and I was blown away. I, I, you know, you should tell the story of, of the, the surface noise and, and right. the decision on the curve. That yeah, was so, a revelation for me. Yeah, so we go through a process um, at PS Audio, and I've worked at other companies um, before, and I'm, and I'm also familiar with how... Company. <laughs> Spit it out. Bowers and Wilkins and Class A Audio, and... There are, di there are different ways of running a R&D department. Um, and I'm also familiar with, with other uh, R&D departments in other fields and in audio. And I have to say that, you know, the, the importance that's placed on listening here because, because, of, because of Paul, um, it's, it's dramatically high. I mean, it's a huge, huge factor. So we have a thing here that's like, Okay, we, we come up with a design, we uh, maybe model it, simulate, go into uh, producing or uh, drawing up the schematic, going to a PCB, building the PCB, and then that's the, that's the first 95% of the whole project. The next 95% is in the listening room over here. And as far as I know, it's, you don't know where you stand until you freaking hook it up to a system. You don't know where you stand. It could be, could be horrible. And we've had you know, bad first listens to products where we're like, OK, well, we've got to rethink this, or there's some key thing that we're forgetting or that we're missing that we need to go back. And many times we find what those things are. Well, um, I hooked this thing up, and Right away, I was, pretty, I was pretty darn happy with it. I was like, OK, we're definitely on the right track. Right away, things are right. I put a, my ear up to the speaker. I can't freaking hear noise on 66 dB again. That's, that's good. Um, going on the right direction there. Uh, the music is very, very good and is rivaling you know, some stuff that I'm hearing on our digital rig, you know, which is quite advanced. This is, this is a good. This is a good start. Um, and so we, what we did was we put on a, actually a record that was kind of poor in quality. So it had a lot of ticks and pops. And what you want to look for is the separation between the music and all that surface noise. So of course, you, you, know, you don't really want a record that has that much surface noise. But what you're doing is you're testing all these capabilities of the amplifiers inside of that, because those ticks and pops can come in at 20 dB-ish above the nominal rating of the cart. So the amps are getting hit with this really high voltage spikes. I mean, the transient uh, 
demand on the electronics are very high in a phono stage. It's very demanding. And so when you listen to those ticks and pops, if there's very low amounts of um, intermodular distortion and, and just uh, nonlinearities in general, um, you're going to see it separate from the, you're going to hear it separate and see it uh, from, from the rest of the music. So you'll hear ticks and pops, and then behind that will be a separation and a clear you know, view into the music. So you can almost, uh, even a really noisy record, you just kind of like remove those ticks and pops. That's what a lot of digital <coughs> listeners don't understand is that after a while, you just don't, you don't hear it anymore. You're just hearing the music. And, um, and a good phono stage is, uh, allows you to separate the surface noise from the actual music, and also the instruments start to have the separation and the clear space between all of them. So, um, so right away, it was pretty good in that regard. You know, I remember Paul thinking, you know, Paul said, hey, this isn't bad at all. This is like one of the better solid state ones I've heard. I think and the comment was it was almost as good as digital. <laughs> that's a Paul. That's a Paul comment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, so, anyways, I went in there and I, I don't know. I was I had this feeling like there just wasn't the one note thing wasn't there for me. It's just I was comparing it to a few other phone stages. It was better. It was better than them, but it's something. Something just told me to start really hunting and really making like the big changes. You know, don't worry about the small stuff yet. And so I decided to try the different rea comps, rea compensations. So again, you have three big ones. You have um, passive, uh, hybrid, and active. And uh, your passive is going to be an actual open loop circuit. That's just going to have like R, R's and C's, and it's going to actually implement this curve before an amplifier, so going into really high impedance so it doesn't load the filter down. The active stages have the compensation in the feedback path of an amp. So it's actually varying the feedback to create the curve, and by that it, it changes the gain of the amp, so you get the frequency, frequency response. I'm yeah, sorry? The game with frequency. With frequency, yeah. yes. Yep. So, um, the, so a uh, hybrid, you implement uh, usually your, your higher pole uh, passively. And your, you have a zero at uh, 500.5 hertz, and you have a pole at uh, 50.5. And so you actually implement those in the feedback, so it's like this hybrid. A lot of, this is the standard, very, very common high-end audio approach of creating a, a um, phono stage. So that's what I had at first. I had the hybrid approach. I went to passive. And there are many reasons why, objectively, I'm kind of like, well, you know, it's not as good in ways. Or there's downsides that I just don't like. It was the one noter. It was instantly, right when I flicked on the switch, it was amazing. The, the, the resolution, the separation of instruments, the surface noise separated even further from the music. When you went to a passive? When I went to the passive, yeah. So, yep. That was the, that was the uh, really what, uh, you know, set me on the right path. And so from there, I am now just tweaking compensations. I'm analyzing amplifiers up to, you know, 1 megahertz, or, or I'm sorry, 10 megahertz, and looking at the, um, st how stable amplifiers are and all that. Sure. And, and yeah, sure, yeah. So this is an early prototype. <laughs> Not everything's populated, but here's the 700 parts, all discrete. <laughs> Down to regulators are all d discrete. The voltage references are all discrete. It's pretty much just <laughs> single ended out. So only? single end. So the amplifier, the op amps that I've created have a um, large. Uh, it's actually not on this board, <laughs> but the um, uh, if you saw a revision above this, yeah, I have large TO220 highly biased MOSFETs that there's only one device doing the whole single, uh, the whole waveform. So that's a single-ended approach. And uh, 
and I, you know, I've, I started to simulate those, um, thinking that it wasn't going to work too well because you don't see single-ended output stages in op amps. And uh, with a lot of bias, they work extraordinarily well. And you don't have any crossover distortion. It's purely class A no matter what. And uh, it's a part of creating that really n a linear open loop path that I was talking about, which is really the fundamental approach with this thing. And so, um, and so anyways, th so that's, the, that's really the approach with this. And anyways, I, uh, we're looking at, what are we looking at for, uh, for release? Well, we're hoping to get this, um, let's see, I would think that will be full-scale production coming up here in like, you know, May and June of this year for sure. But maybe even a little earlier than that if we can push it. The yep. goal is don't push too hard. Give Darren all the time he needs. <laughs> What's the retail? Retail is going to be between, uh, right now, uh, $2,000 and $2,200. Yeah, so, um, so a little bit uh, more expensive than the rest of the Stellar stuff, but again, you can, you can see the level of detail that's gone in, and uh, we just didn't want to create a stage that is like all the others. We want something that's going to you know, give the, the one note response and, and for people to really see the value of upgrading to the next level stage. So. So yeah, um, up to 72 dB on, on moving coil with uh, tons of options for loading. You're going to have a potentiometer um, that's uh, capable of loading uh, from 1 ohm to 1K. And then you're going to have individual settings that you can set from a remote from your listening chair. Uh, that's going to be 60, 100, 200 and 47K for the uh, moving coil. And then the uh, moving magnet's going to be set at 4,700 uh, picofarads. Um, and that's going to be three gain settings on the moving, um, moving magnet, which is going to be around um, uh, th 36, 40, and 46 dB. And then the uh, moving coils gains are as low as 60 dB and as high as uh, 72. What so tons the, of what flexibility. Is the balance, Jack, so know. yeah, so this is uh, there's supposed to be another one populated here. So you have a balanced output. Two, two, oh, you do. Yeah, you do have balanced output, but you don't have balanced in on this one. We're creating a newer a stage that's going to be a, above this. That's going to have fully balanced path, but a stellar. You know, of course, there's going to be some, you know, uh, compromises, and that's just one that we don't have. We don't have the uh, balanced inputs. And you said variable so. MC loading from one to a thousand. Yes, that's correct. Yep, and that's going to be notated as like a custom setting. So you take the remote and you can just go to custom, and they'll be whatever you set. That was going to be my question: Is it, um, a, a, you know, custom accessible um, on the fly kind of changes? So. It is only only from the back. So you could set, you know, say you want 500 ohms, you set it for 500, and then you'll have your 60, 100, 200, 47k, and then your custom selection on your remote. So the custom would be. Whatever you set the backs, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I was just curious. You didn't mention uh, current gain, uh, at least for uh, moving coil type, as mm. another possibility. Whether you explored that at all, and listen to any of the current type uh, preamps. I, I, yeah, I didn't. And I'm not. I'm not too familiar with with what's out on the market with that. Um, but uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing. A very common way of doing or implementing a moving coil input is using um, bipolar input. Because that's, you know, you want a low, a low source impedance from a cartridge like a moving coil. It's going to make sense to use bipolars. There's a problem with it, though. The problem is a bipolar, by um, definition, is going to actually pull base current. And so in order to get those bipolars really low noise, you've got to run current down them. And to run current down them, by definition, again, it means that you're increasing the amount of base current going into it, meaning you have to, in other words, you have to uh, capacitor couple the input. And I'm not, I'm not crazy about that, especially for you know, this price range. I try to stay away. This is directly coupled, all of it. I don't want a series cap. I can't afford it. And, and you know, to have one that's going to be absolutely transparent, it's going to be too much money. So I went with FETs, like massively paralleled FETs. 
and I am I'm working on actually uh, 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 I need to get it, my final prototype all in a chassis to actually get the final input voltage noise but it's well under a nanovolt um, I know that for a fact but uh, once I get it actually fully shielded I'll be able to make an official spec on that what sort of rails are you running uh, plus minus 27 so you get oh yeah yeah yep. it's uh, one of the keys yeah yep. cuz you the surface noise and pops I mean it can really really swing especially on your input stage of a moving magnet before the actual EQ rolls off the top end it's very demanding up in the upper ranges you know by 20 kilohertz you don't have much musical information but maybe by 10 kilohertz or by 8 it's very demanding on an amp. Yep. Any other questions? Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I see just from looking at it from this distance that you're using all polymer caps pretty much in every regard. Uh, is there, is there, uh, were you able to uh, get large enough polymers that you didn't have to use any um, uh, electrolytics for the larger tank? Caps, you know. So these are actually electrolytics. They're they're just surface mounts, and the the the, um, the polymer types that you're talking about, they they do look a lot like this. It's just because they're offered in a surface mount. Okay. But the thing about polymers is that they're generally really low voltage, yeah. and and uh, pretty low capacitance as well. But with that, you get the low ESR and the low inductance. Now that's not really um, you know for switch mode applications and high frequency applications. That's big. But believe it or not, um, and I did, I did a lot of work at uh, B&W on this, we, we preferred higher ESR caps on, on power supply decoupling. I know some of the, you know, I'm seeing some eyebrows go up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a thing. You don't, want, you don't want zero source impedance on a power supply in audio all the time. You will actually want some dampening. So that, that's, you know. I, I was actually just discussing this with John Curl the other day, and and you know he was talking about how he how he isolates stages like that, and it's it's a really important thing. It's a, it's within the audio community, it's it's quite common to make sure that you have some sort of isolation from a regulator. You don't want it to be absolute, like really, you know, milli ohms of of source impedance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.